Irvin Yalom, your work has been so profoundly inspiring and therapeutic for so many people. You managed to bring your whole being with a capital B to every book you write. Beyond the intellectual ideas that you've explored on the personal level, your bravery in being so openly human, authentic, and vulnerable has for me been more than inspiring. It's been transformational because you've shown that it's possible to do so. So with that, I'll start with my first question. Okay. What do you think the proper relationship between philosophy and psychology should be? And how are these disciplines intertwined and how should they support each other? Well, that's, that's not an easy question, really. Um, my own experience uh, of this was when I was starting, <clears throat> I had a, I went to medical school, had no philosophy in my undergraduate program because I wanted to get into medical school and I wanted to get into medical school rather quickly over in three years rather than four because I wanted to get married to this young woman I was with and didn't want her to get away from me. <laughs> so I just took a straight pre-med course, which meant all sciences. And um, I started medical school then. And But when I started my medical uh, residency, after finishing medical school and doing an internship, uh, I was at Johns Hopkins and I was, um, I was looking, uh, reading a book of great interest to me by Roland Moe called Existence. Yeah. And I was beginning to, to realize that there was a whole world of, of thought uh, that I really was, was not in touch with. And, uh, after after reading his 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 book, I decided I better get me a education in in philosophy, and so I enrolled in the uh, year long philosophy course at at, at Hopkins. Um, and uh, every evening, I I drove over to the university, which was a little distance from the medical school, and started taking philosophy courses from him, and I continued that. Uh, in my reading, and when I went to Stanford, I took courses and figures that were of great interest to me, Nietzsche and Kierkegaard, um, by by two out, outstanding teachers at uh, at Stanford. So that's been my 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 philosophy background. Um, and how do you think philosophy enriches psychology? Well. Uh, I think taking a look at how we regard uh, our our lives and our deaths, what death means to us, um, <clears throat> uh, the extent to which it um, enters into our life, how much we dread it, uh, how much we fear, how much we fear it. Uh, I feel it's 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 quite important to uh, to to see what the sages have taught us about that. So, and I, I had some relationship too, once when, when I was in need of therapy, I started to <coughs> uh, form a, a group, a group, a woman came to me with metastatic cancer, uh, breast cancer that had spread to um, other parts of her body and was untreatable. And, and certainly in those days, uh, and she asked me whether I could form a group of people. Uh, no such group had ever been done before, but I, I, I gave that a try. It stirred up a lot of feelings about death and fears about death in me. And I went into treatment then with that very person whose first book I had read named Rollo May. He, right. happened to, he happened to have moved to California at that time. so. I, I saw him for almost almost two years at that time, and it was a it was a very enlightening experience for me. And um, what did you find out about your own death anxiety through that experience? <clears throat> I began to, to to find out that I, it was very important to go into the end of life with having as few regrets as possible. Uh, and to to 
pursue the things I was really interested in and, and see if I could accomplish those things. Um, and so that's why I did Roll May. I told me later on, I became friends with him. And I was like, I was with him when he died. Uh, but he told me later on that he knew he helped me with my death anxiety, but that I made his a lot worse. <laughs> because he was he was about 22 years <clears throat> 22 years older than I was and then I wrote and then I wrote a book called existential uh, um, what the, what, I, okay, existential psychotherapy yeah, existential yes. psychotherapy where I focused on on existential issues on on death and on uh, meaning in life um, and so uh, that was a, a very enlightening experience. I spent a couple of years writing that book. And so I, I try to incorporate, incorporate all these things as I, as I see patients. Absolutely. I feel that the existential model really gives a, um, the right base mm -hmm. with which to look at everything psychological, every, every anxiety that we have has a deeper roots and uh, philosophy gives us that uh, that ability to really go deeper mm -hmm. so my next question you've mentioned that your memory has started to decline and that because of this you've begun seeing clients for single sessions only right what have you learned through this new medium of therapy what have you struggled with and how do you think the single therapy session can impact a person's life for the better well, I'm, I'm pretty certain that a single session can impact a person's life very much if it's, <laughs> because I've had experience of this time after time after time. Um, so I've been seeing patients, generally I do about one every day, about six a week. Um, <clears throat> and I'm so still scheduled up for about three or four months in advance now. Um, and most of the time I, I, I do a lot of work with the patient in the here and now, by which I mean that I'm asking them to take a look at what this conversation is like with me, what they hope they get from me, what they, what they feel they're getting now. So I do work with the, with the here and now with, with individuals and, um, and I find that to be uh, 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 quite important. It moves them into the to, to a, th a therapeutic conversation much more easily and, and freely. I also work with a, a lot. I've seen a lot of patients who want to see me because they have a a, a great fear of death, and um, generally, over and over again, the the formula becomes more and more uh, common, more accurate, that the, the more regress one has about the way one lives one's life, the more death anxiety that people might have. Um, and I know for, for me, um, whereas I've often had a lot of death anxiety in the past, I have very little now, almost, it, it's not an issue for me. First of all, this is not a great time of life, and I'm not having much fun. Um, and um, I've lost my wife, and I'm losing my memory, and um, uh, I also have a balance problem, so I can't uh, walk as well as I as I could before. Um, so uh, I have very little fear of of death at this point. I wrote in the book, and I've also often said this to some of my consultees, um, that there, <clears throat> that, that I I think sometimes that when I die, I'll be I'll be joining Marilyn, um, which my intellect tells me that's just total nonsense. Of course, I'm not going to be joining her. It doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, she doesn't exist any longer. Um, I've been pretty much of an atheist since I was about 13. Um, and yet, at the same time, the mere thought 
uh, that I'll be joining Maryland uh, seems to calm me. Uh, it makes me feel, and that it's very interesting to that this other part of my brain which is calmed by that, and it tells me something about what religion has offered mankind over over the many centuries that uh, it offers this the sense that well death won't be the end there'll be some continuation some other kind of life and so there's a part of me that takes comfort from that even though my intellect tells me no that's, that's nonsense well if our intellect was enough to make us feel good and to get over the different anxieties of life you know we would use it all the time and we wouldn't need therapy so mm -hmm. sometimes these these beliefs, these ideas, mm -hmm. you know, they can provide solace yep. in a in an uncertain world. Right. Um, so my next question, a question that I've often asked myself is, what actually enables someone to change? Many times clients are struggling with the same host of issues for years and are stuck in negative loops of thinking or self-destructive behaviors, but at the end of the day, after all the struggles and after all the hours of therapy, there seems to be a moment where a turning point happens, where the light goes off and where the person is able to shift out of these old patterns and begins to make positive changes. And I've often thought about it as a leap mm -hmm. of faith. I don't know what else to call it because often people intellectually know what they need to change, but for years are unable to do so. But then there's that pivotal moment at which a true change of perspective occurs and progress yeah. begins. What do you think happens there? What facilitates that almost magical moment of change? And why are some people able to make that change? And why are some people unable to do so? Well, that's a very difficult question for me to, for me to answer. Um, mostly, I will say, you know, if you want to change, get into therapy. And I tell most of my consultees that it's important for them to be in therapy. That, that's the start of it, uh, to, 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 to get into therapy and really begin work, working on your issues. Um, so one of, one of my jobs with, with many, of the, many of the consultants I see is to try to get them into therapy, into a kind of therapy that I think will be helpful to them. So I, I, that's one of the aims of, of my my consultation is, is to point out to them why they should be in therapy and talk to them about the kind of therapist they think they need. Um, so, and, and sometimes people will will need therapy many times. Uh, and um, I, th and I feel that very, um, more and more I'm coming to believe that has associated a lot with with the early experiences in life uh, and there there's a good bit of research that really begins to support that um, there's a, a a book that i've read recently on the ace test ace means uh, adverse childhood experiences and uh, the, there's, a, there's a lot of data coming through now that adverse childhood experiences, uh, you know, uh, really profoundly affect us and, and don't go away very easily. If we've had uh, uh, some rather neglectful or cruel parenting, if we've had um, sexual abuse in our first, first early years of life, um, that, that simply does not go away. Uh, it, it's with us. They need to be in therapy on several occasions in their life, and I, I try to reassure people about about that. That uh, you 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 just don't clear this up with one one bout of therapy. You may need to go back and back again. Um, and I, I I have a uh, that's that's an old idea back with some of the early work with primates with Harry Harlow as he, as he took a look at 
with the primates yeah. and he separated them from their mothers or gave them statues who were who were their mothers really um and never getting the sort of love or warmth or support uh those those young primates never did very well in adulthood and in adulthood you you need to be in therapy on, on more than one occasion and i tell people not to be not to be stingy with themselves about that. They get back and back into, into therapy. Um, you find that for people who have experienced um, difficult traumas in their early childhood, that therapy acts as sort of maintenance for, for well-being, sort, sort of tool for emotional regulation? Is yeah, it I both, both of those two, those two ideas are, are good, but I, I don't think you can do it with one bout of therapy. I, I think you need to go back again and again. And that is so true with childhood sexual abuse. Uh, that, that is something that really just doesn't go away very easily. And what do you think in, happens in therapy that allows someone to get over that? Is it a rewriting of your own narrative? that you see the situation in a different way? How, how does therapy help here? Um, so, oh, so many different ways. Uh, being with someone who is on your side, uh, who is helpful to you, who you care for a lot, who um, points out what you're doing, um, who tries to give you some kind of uh, uh, steam and how to love yourself, uh, what you do that might be driving others away. It's it's a very complicated thing to go on and on and on with like that. But there, there's someone that you can really be close with. It's maybe like another parent in some ways. Yeah. Right to to fulfill the empathy that you haven't received, and also there's almost this healing of the interpersonal element of, mm -hmm. of nurturing that part of yourself and knowing how to 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 connect with people yeah. and, and and to open yourself up to love and to healthy connections mm -hmm. where someone who's had that abuse might might have all sorts of blocks up right and the and, and therapeutic uh, relationship allows for that that's right uh, exactly. Now, I have a, a, a question, and it's uh, more in terms of uh, relationships and marriage. We live in an age where the monogamous relationship and the institution of marriage itself are really being questioned and reconsidered. I'm very old school in this regard, where I really believe that finding a partner with whom you can dance through all the stages of life with is immeasurably better and more satisfying than going through life alone or drifting from one love affair to the next. And I see your marriage to Marilyn as a prime example of this whole world that can open up before you uh, through this relationship with another individual. I think in today's culture, we think of marriage as a narrowing and limiting of options and opportunities. But I think what might be missing in today's narrative around marriage is the fact that it allows you to build something with another person that's bigger than either one of you, mm -hmm. like family and community and the possibility of mutually nurturing each other's careers and intellectual worlds like you and Marilyn have done. So this is my perspective, uh, perhaps it's naive and romantic, um, but what I'd like to ask you is, what do you think of this rejection of monogamy that we're seeing in today's culture? What are the beautiful things about marriage that you'd like people to know about and understand? And obviously a healthy marriage comes with a lot of hard work. So if you'd also be willing to maybe share with us some of the struggles of your marriage and how you overcame and reconciled different conflicts. Well, I, I've known Marilyn since she was, since she was 14. Uh, she was a she was a very stabilizing influence on me <clears throat> because I I was particularly unhappy and unsure of myself in in those years because my first years were 
were pretty chaotic. Uh, living in a, I, I told the story of Marilyn and my childhood many times to many of the consultees that I've been seeing. <clears throat> But I grew up in a really bad neighborhood in Washington, D.C., which was, um, it was a poor black neighborhood. There were only a couple of white people in the neighborhood, people who owned stores there. Um, my parents didn't want me playing with black children. They didn't want them coming to the house. I, so I spent a lot of time in the library reading during that time, and it was it was dangerous. There were lots of robberies in that neighborhood, so it was not a, not a, a good place to grow up for my first fourteen years. The uh, this this part of the story is that Marilyn's Marilyn's father came from a came from a shtetl in, in Russia, like minded but not the same one. They they never knew each other really, but he he came to the he came and saw. A grocery store that he bought uh, that was just one block away from my father's store, uh, just a block away. Um, but he said he, he couldn't bring up his three daughters in, in a neighborhood like that. It's much too dangerous. So he bought a small house, a nice part of town, far away, and commuted commuted to the store every day. Um, my uh, Marilyn never ever saw his store. She never came to it. Um, and she grew up in a neighborhood with, she had a very kind mother and, uh, uh, took elocution lessons and dancing lessons and, um, and, um, French lessons and, um, uh, uh, never had any kind of negative experience in her life. And consequently, uh, she, she didn't even quite know what anxiety was. Uh, she, she never, she never had to see a therapist. Um, she was always very socially gifted. She was president of her class every year and valedictorian in the high school. Um, so we were so different in that way. And, and the difference really was our, our early, early life experiences. And, and what do you think about connecting with someone on that level and building a life with another individual? Mm -hmm. What does that allow? that you wouldn't have been able to do otherwise? Well, to know someone since they were, since they were 14 and know everything about, about all their school days. And we shared all these, all these friendships that had some, had some of its positive features. Uh, I hated to be separated by her and it was different, difficult, uh, when she, she went to Wellesley. And I stayed in Washington, D.C. and um, uh, decided early on to become a doctor. So I took nothing but science courses there and wanted to get into medical school in three years. And you could do that. It's rare, but you usually have to get a four. But I took all the medical classes in three years. I took no, I think I had one or two electives where I took, I think, British American poetry. Um, but otherwise, I, I was eager, anxious to get into school. In those years, uh, there was a, um, the Jews were only allowed 5% in the medical school class. So for me to be in the upper 5% of my class, I decided there's only one way to do that, and that, and that is to get all A's. <laughs> and so if I, went, if I went to this college, George Washington, I got all A's they would have to take me into medical school, which they did. Uh, so, um, so I didn't get a, 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 a full education. I didn't get the humanities and that, that came later on in my life. Um, so I was just in a rush to get into, into, uh, into medical school. And the rush was really about, I wanted to just nail Marilyn down before she got <laughs> And she went up to Wellesley and was going out with Harvard people and I was full of anxiety that, uh, that I would lose her, but, uh, somehow we, we stayed together. That's beautiful. Your relationship is so inspiring for so many of us. Um, my, my next question is one of the themes that you've developed and, uh, mentioned today that you use in your therapy is this concept of the here and now. 
to investigate what's happening at this very moment. You know, what information are we getting from this human to human interaction in this space and at this time? Yeah. Uh, and, and so what do you think is so valuable about the here and now approach? How can people use this idea also outside of the therapy room in their own life and relationships? Well, in therapy, it, as I use it with consultations, um, it's I, I can get very easily and clearly into some of the some of the individuals' basic problems in ways I couldn't before. Uh, so, for example, <clears throat> one of the stories I've written about consultations is a is a woman uh, she. She, she was uh, coming, she was in uh, Norway, uh, but she had grown up elsewhere. I, I go to great lengths to disguise the people's names that I've yeah. used and they've gotten their permission. But she complained to me that, and she was a very beautiful woman, very lovely, but she complained to me that she had a lot of first dates, but she never had a second date. And so we started talking about that. And, um, and I, I was aware that she simply uh, she she simply couldn't relate to me as, as I uh, as I tried to ask her well, how how are you how are we doing she didn't know what I was talking about exactly and I, I began to point out to her that what was happening between between her and me and me in our session was a social uh, microcosm. Uh, she didn't quite understand that at first, but I'm saying that what's happening here between you and me is what's happening to you uh, on the outside. You know, you can't see it. And, and, and the way she was with me is that she simply uh, couldn't relate to me. Uh, any of the questions I asked, she, she was cold and distant and stayed further away. So I began to point out to her exactly what you're doing to me is a microcosm of what you're doing to, to people out there. And you have to learn another way of being with people. Um, so, I mean, that's the way I use the here and now in, in my therapy and in all these consultations. I, you can get to the heart of the matter by looking at the here and now uh, much, more, much more quickly. Uh, than you ordinarily would in ongoing therapy. So I think a lot of the patient's basic problems, any problems that have to do with their relationships, and that's true for so many issues, uh, you take a look at how you and that person are, are relating to one another. So I, I, I fully embrace looking at the, at the here and now. Right. There's this idea that we're constantly playing out the same dramas with each interaction right. and that the therapy room allows us to investigate that same, those same patterns and those same exactly. behaviors um, in, a, in a setting that's empathetic to our needs and uh, where we can really understand what's mm -hmm. going on. Um, my last question, and it's um, a, bit, a bit broad. There's this sense in today's culture that there's a certain resistance to growing up as if a um, person's life ends after their 20s. And I'm often perplexed by that because personally, I'm very excited for the different stages of my life. Certain concerns I have today that I know in the next stages of my life I won't have, but also that each decade brings with it its own unique set right. of challenges. And so looking back at your life, if you had to describe the color and flavor, you know, of, of each one of these stages, what were the best things of each stage and what were the challenges that each stage brought you, with you it? You ask difficult questions here. <laughs> <laughs> I prepared, I prepared. <laughs> uh, each stage was so, so different with, with my wife, you know, our courtship stages lasting for years and years since we met at such a young age. <clears throat> Anxiety ridden, I'm sure, until you uh, you're able oh, to yeah. lock her down. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> and 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 then we had uh, we had children quite early on. And those were somewhat 
difficult years because she, she was a, a wonderful scholar and uh, had every intention of going on continuing her studies just as I had mine. I was not the only scholar in the family. <clears throat> and so each child that came, um, I, I had to do whatever I could to take some of that burden off, off of her. Um, so, uh, so there was that period. We and we had we had four children, and um, uh, I I cannot say that I shared I shared fifty percent of the growing up. There's no way I did that. As <laughs> I, I was an MD and struggling through my residency, and uh, so I. But she, we always, we always had help in the family. But, but she, show, she never stopped in her studies. She, uh, she graduated from Wellesley, and then she decided she wanted to get a PhD in, in uh, comparative literature in German and French. So when I went to Hopkins as a resident. She started the Hopkins program, got her PhD from Hopkins. So she she never never stopped. Her career, in a slight sense, was secondary to mine since uh, she went where where I where I got a position. When I went in the army, you know, she she had to go. She yeah. had to go. Well, to go, to go to Hawaii isn't so bad. <laughs> yeah. Well, we were first going first. We went to basic training in Texas. That was pretty bad. That was a few. That was a few weeks, and then oh. <laughs> I was on my way to Germany. At the very, very last minute, we heard that there was an open place in Hawaii uh, where an admiral had retired or something, and so we went to Hawaii, which was the most fortunate thing that ever happened to us. And in Hawaii, we had quite quite a wonderful life. Um, the army psychiatry wasn't a tremendous interest to me because it was uh, it was during a time when the interest of all my patients was how do I get out of the military, um, <laughs> yeah. one, way, one way or the other. Um, um, there was not a war at that at that point, and and uh, and Marilyn started teaching at the University of Hawaii and kept up her work and. We we loved Hawaii so much. We, we would have stayed there if there had been a medical school there that I could have taught at, uh, because she she felt I felt that I really wanted to do academic uh, medicine rather than go into private practice. I wanted to be able to read and uh, and to to write and to do research, and so um, we would have stayed in Hawaii if, if, if there were a four-year medical school, but there wasn't. So we, we, we applied to the places that were as close as possible, which was San Francisco. Uh, otherwise, we would have gone back to Washington to where we grew up, and I would have gone into private practice there. So I got a position uh, offered at, at Stanford, which was uh, uh, had all kinds of promise because it was just opening up a brand new medical school there. And uh, I was uh, I was blessed that I had a, a teacher there who felt that I had some real promise, and uh, I had already written a couple of articles, which is unusual for a medical student to do. So, he, um, and so he more or less gave me pretty full freedom to do whatever I wanted to do through my whole stay at Stanford. Uh, I got I got interested in group therapy and began. Um, wrote wrote the textbook on group therapy and uh, was doing all, all everything that I wanted to do. I, I was very fortunate in, in being in such a, a great institution and being close to Hawaii too. We we got there vacations. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And Hawaii is incredible. I I wanted to ask also, how, where do you think that you learned? your empathy, because I, I'm pretty sure it's not taught in medical school as part of, um, you know, becoming a psychiatrist. Where do you think you, you've developed this gift? I, I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, it's true I feel it more and more now than I ever have. Um, 
uh, and I feel very strongly with my single consultations that I, <clears throat> that I want to find some way to offer them something, to be helpful to them in some way, uh, to hear their story and can get into that story. And, and in a single session, I'm doing a single session. Um, but I started that a couple of years right. ago because my memory was getting, I uh, was flaking away as it does for people my age. I turned 90 a few weeks ago. And uh, <clears throat> um, so I, I feel very strong that I want to give each person something, something of value to them. So uh, there's, that's, that's my only motive really in, in working with this. I, I, I set a fee for, for people, but um, I just set the same fee psychiatrists charge in California. But on the statement that I sent to them, if this is too exp if this feels unaffordable for you in difficult times, I'm very, very willing to cut the fee. And people take me up on that. Maybe, I don't know, probably almost a half the people will say that. And, and I will, uh, I'm glad to cut it to whatever fee there is. The money doesn't mean anything to me at this point in my life. Uh, so I feel a very strong empathy for these individual people that I'm seeing each each day. If you were able to convey words of empathy to your 20 year old self, what would you say? Knowing everything that you know today. I was so full of anxiety at that time. Uh, I was in anxious about losing Marilyn, anxious about everything, anxious about acceptance. I'd, uh, I, I was stormed by anxiety and started the therapy right away when I went into my residency. In those days, um, people going into the field uh, often had a uh, full psychoanalysis. So I did that. When I started Hopkins, I started uh, seeing someone four times a week for uh, three years. That adds up to about 600 times. Um, don't think I learned very much from that. <laughs> I think Why I, I not? Think, well, I think I learned that maybe psychoanalysis and the method of treatment was, was not a good method. Uh, there was so little connection between me and the therapist, uh, at least the particular therapist that I had. And uh, uh, she was out of view. I couldn't see her. She's behind the couch. Um, and um, it was... It was yeah. Really, an investigation of uh, uh, what was happening between me and her. I met a man in my residency named Jerome Frank. He was a wonderful teacher, and he was very interested in group therapy. And I watched his group uh, for, as all, all the residents did, for a month or so. But uh, after they stopped, um, that was all that was required. I, I watched it for almost the whole year. And then he invited me in to. To, to, do, to do therapy with him in the group. And I, I did a lot of group therapy then. And, and the group is, is, a, is a group of looking at interpersonal therapy, uh, how you relate to other people. And as you take histories, it's not so much based always on your parents, but who were your, who were your friends? Who were your chums? What was all that like? How do you relate to others? Um, and so group therapy, in a sense, is, is relational therapy. Uh, you, you are looking at how you relate to these other six other people in the group. And I, I got very interested in group therapy and wrote the, the textbook of group therapy. Uh, it's written six times now. The last edition was uh, like 800 pages and a couple thousand uh you know, reviews of, of literature uh, and quotations of uh, other other writers. So it was, it took up a, a great deal of my time. Um, I fortunately had a colleague who helped me with the, with the last with the last two. But uh, I've always I've always enjoyed looking at how people relate to one another in the group and how I relate to individuals in the therapy. And as I even do these consultations, I, I take a look at how we're relating, what's going on between the two of us. 
um, and uh, I, I feel that's where the that's where the the real change occurs in psychotherapy. And finding out what's happening between the two of us that's right. and how we're relating. Right. Yeah. How, how are we doing today, you and I? <laughs> I think we're doing fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I was very, very excited to speak to you. So this has been uh, great, you know, to uh, to get to ask you these questions and, um, and, you know, to hear about your life. And, you know, I've read so much of what you've done. Um, now, um, just to finish. Yes. Um, I just like to say that I have a tremendous amount of respect and admiration for you. And I think that one of your unique qualities is that by being so human in your approach, you also evoke a lot of love from the people around you and your readers, myself included. Your books have been a true gift to the world and to the body of human knowledge. And more than being a contribution to the field of psychology alone, I think your books have helped to evolve our understanding of what it means to be human. Your work has touched so many lives and helped so many people and will continue doing so for years and years to come. So Irvin, you are a true mensch through and through, and it has been an extraordinary honor and pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you so much for spending your precious time with me. It's been a great pleasure for me too. You're an unusual interviewer. <laughs> you are. You're, you're, How so? Well, you're quite wonderful. You. Uh, you are very, very well informed. You are perfectly willing to engage with me. We could get into taking a look at the here and now between the two of us. Uh, you're, you're, you've been, it's been quite wonderful talking to you. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. What a, what a pleasure to hear. <laughs>